Welcome. This is the Lifetime Cash Flow through Real Estate Investing Podcast. This is where you'll learn strategies to help you achieve lifetime financial freedom through real estate investment. Your host, Rod Cleef, has owned over 2,000 homes and apartments. And he brings experts in all aspects of real estate investment and management onto the show. Now, here's your host, Rod Cleef. Welcome to another edition of How to Build Lifetime Cash Flow Through Real Estate Investing. I'm Rod Cleef, and I'm thrilled you're here. It's not often someone gets an opportunity to interview one of their heroes, and I got to tell you, this guy is definitely one of mine. My guest today is Frank McKinney. He calls himself a philanthrocapitalist, and I'll tell you why in a minute. He's truly a rock star in real estate development. He's a best-selling author in four different genres. He's an entrepreneur, and most importantly, he's, in my view, an incredible philanthropist. When he went to high school, he went to four different high schools because he, he was asked to leave the first three. That tells you a little about him. He's a, he's a rebel, and uh, he, he had his high school diploma with a 1.8 GPA, and then uh, after he graduated with $50 in his pocket, he went from Indiana to Florida in search of his calling. I'm going to let you, him tell you his story, but uh, I, I will tell you this. He, he was fixing and flipping houses, which you guys can all relate to, and then ended up building spec homes all the way up into the $50 million range. And for those of you that don't know what a spec home is, it's you're building a house and you don't have a buyer for it yet. And now he's currently uh, kicking butt with something called a micro mansion that I'll have him tell you about. He's been on, he's been on Oprah. He's been on 2020. He's been on the cover of USA Today. He's been on 2000 print stories. And, uh, you know, I, I'll tell you, uh, but his biggest thing that, that really impressed me was, well, I'll tell you what happened. I, I read his book, Make It Big, years ago. And I was, uh, I've given away dozens of copies of this book. You guys got to get this book. It's called Make It Big by Frank McKinney. It's fantastic. But about six months ago, I needed a pick me up. And so I pulled this book off the shelf again and I Googled Frank to see what he was up to. And I discovered something about him that I didn't know when I first read his book. He has a charity and he has built homes in Haiti for over 10,000 people. Okay, guys, did you hear that? He's built homes for 10,000 people. Now, I got to tell you, if you've seen Frank, he looks like a rock star. But I, when I found this out about him, I realized he really is a rock star. Frank, I'm thrilled you're on the show, buddy. Thank you. Well, the last time we talked, Rod, you were sitting right across from me at where I'm sitting right now in my oceanfront treehouse with your son. And right. we had we spent a couple hours, I think, together. And it was just it was memorable. And I remember you were I think you were just starting your podcast back then. And look, at it's grown to some 50,000 yeah. followers. So really. Yeah, no, it's thank you. Thank you. And I will tell you that, guys, I, you know, when I when I looked him up, I found out that he does one on one coaching sessions at this treehouse, which is very cool. It, it's where it's his office in Delray Beach. And, you know, I, you know, you've heard me talk about the power of mentors on this show and. You know, I definitely consider Frank a mentor, and and it's not cheap to spend time with Frank. I will tell you that in his time because his time is limited and extremely valuable. But I believe in being mentored by the best. And and when I found out all the money he collects for the, for the mentoring goes to his charity, it was a no brainer. So I brought my 21 year old over there, and we met Frank, and and it was a fantastic experience. So anyway, listen, I'm thrilled you're on the show, buddy. And and um, you know, maybe you can expand on. Your history a little bit. I, I, I could have gone on for 30 minutes uh, about your background, but you can do a much better job about that than yeah, I Yeah, I want to get to the meat of you know trying to help your listeners really make, make okay. some money in real estate. So I'll spend just a couple minutes. I, I, as you, you covered okay. most of it. I came from Indiana when I was 18 years old with a $50 bill and a one-way plane ticket from Indiana. I was a corn, kind of corn-fed country boy, the oldest of six, lived on a farm. Uh, you know, it just, I did have a, a troubled youth. I think it was a, a misdirected youth. I, I was, uh, unchallenged. I, I enjoyed school when I wanted to, but I, I didn't think that I was getting much out of most of the courses other than writing and English and literature, which I did really well with. And it's hence the reason the five books have sold so well. But I, you know, I knew that there was a, there was a higher calling, a professional highest calling for Frank. And I didn't call it that back then at 18. Like who knows what they want at 18? Nobody does. So it's not, Nothing fantastic about coming to Florida with 50 bucks at 18, who has more than $50 at 18. Right. But, you know, and I landed here, you and I are close to the same age, and there was a television show on TV back then called Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. <laughs> and then it was, it was a show, for those of you a little younger, MTV Cribs would be something similar today. So you get to look inside the life and the style of the rich and famous. And I got to see it for real in Palm Beach County. I was a, uh, 
maintenance worker on a golf course earning 180 bucks a week. And I was around people who could uh, somehow, to me, it was, um, it was amazing and baffling that they could afford to play golf all day. It didn't seem like they ever worked. And then I, I uh, moved, was moved over to the tennis courts as a maintenance worker there. And the same people that played golf for four hours in the morning seemed to play tennis for you know three hours in the afternoon with tea and crumpets <laughs> in between, right? They just <laughs> never seemed to work. But it was fat, you know, young. I am young at the time, impressionable. I'm 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 just uh, fascinated by this this lifestyle that had, was very foreign to me. But how did they get it? Like how did they get to live this way? I wasn't going to earn it by way of a degree in college because of my GPA didn't even allow me to pursue a community college. So I I started to earn my PhD in entrepreneurship and my, really my <laughs> master's in in real estate on the tennis court. I became a tennis pro by the way. I was a, I was a teaching tennis pro and I taught. Very rich people had to hit a better forehand and a backhand, but I was around affluence. I was I I, I started my own business, and I purposely chose the the up and coming clubs on the ocean, and the condominiums that were being built on the intercoastal waterway in Boca Raton, Florida. And for those of you who don't know, Boca Raton's like the Beverly Hills of Florida. It is it is the you know the high net worth zip code. And and here I saw these people that would drive up to their lessons in their Ferraris and their Lamborghinis and Mercedes, and they'd have the beautiful wife or a handsome husband, and they'd have the two kids and the yacht and the mansion. How did they get it? How did you, Mr. Tennis Student, earn this lifestyle? And the, 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 the answer I, I heard as I would run them around very hard for 45 minutes, Rod, on purpose, on purpose, so they couldn't finish their hour-long <laughs> lesson – and, and as they as they sat down puffing and puffing for the last fifteen minutes, I'd bring them a cold towel of water. I say, "How'd you get here?" And, and, and over and over, over a two year span, the the answer I heard rung of some kind of, of a real estate related endeavor. So wow, you know, they weren't born real estate investors, but they they were nine to fivers, be it you know inventors or or lawyers or what have you. But then they took their discretionary income, money left over after paying bills and taxes and stuff. And they invested in real estate, and that's where they really made their fortune. M- m- not all of them, but I will tell you, in disproportionate share, I'll remember clearly made their money in real estate. And I said, I got to do it. I mean, guys, that's 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 awesome. I want to interject one thing. I actually have a. It's so funny that you're talking about this because I just did a little segment on my driving force success tips that's coming out on Monday about the power of your peer group. And this ties right into that. You were surrounded by affluence and you had the ability to ask, you know, what they do and how they do it. I hope you guys are getting this. And and uh, so anyway, please continue. That's awesome. Yeah, so the, the, that they were mentors to me, you know, 15 right. minutes at a time. But it was a recurring basis, right? These people would take an right. hour long lesson, maybe twice a week. And, and I got to hear them for, for a couple of years. I was making a hundred thousand dollars a year plus as a 21 year old tennis instructor back then that was a lot of money i had a ferrari i bought my own ferrari i mean i i I, and i don't say that to impress anybody it was just that i you know i really wanted what i saw you these other people drive and know that lifestyle and i taught this woman who actually owned a car dealership so i got a pretty good deal on the ferrari and that's so funny that's that's, that that that, you know i have a similar story i I got a maserati when i was that age same thing and not to impress but you know that's you want to you want to live that lifestyle that's 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 funny well i I probably bought it to impress then i don't share the story to impress now i just right that's that's right that's right that's right and i and i i i then i then came off the tennis court slowly because i was making a really good living i had to eat right i can't just go into real estate and then and at age 22 I bought my first fixer upper. Matter of fact, I just celebrated my my thirtieth anniversary in the real estate business on May nineteenth. So that tells you how old I am. And 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 I uh, I, I bought a, a thirty five thousand dollar crack house. You know, two bedroom, one bath. Fixed it up. And, and unlike what, what you're teaching most people to do, which is you know buy and hold and cash flow through through real estate, I, I had a different kind of cash flow, and it was buy and sell. It was buy, fix, sell, buy, fix, sell. Right. And I didn't do that. Now this is this is the first kind of lesson. My father, who wasn't in real estate, gave me my first bit of real estate advice, and he said, "I used to go by the nickname of Mickey back then. He called me Mickey. He said, Mickey, you know, you 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 you, you are in you are you are in a wonderful line of work, but you don't know exactly how it is that you're going to make money. You're too young. You don't understand it. I suggest to you that you enter a cash accumulation stage or phase of your career." Making money, making enough money so you can decide whether to, 
you know, wholesale or retail or buy and hold or buy, you know, uh, uh, storage units or what have you, or be a contractor. You don't know. I mean, you're too new to this. You're right. a tennis pro. Right. And I right. said, okay, dad. And, 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 it, and it made sense. So I entered the buy and sell simply to, to get enough money. And the goal was to, re- to, to make a hundred thousand dollars, like have a hundred thousand dollars liquid, liquid, then decide what I wanted to do. Was I going to buy and hold? Was I, you know, was I going to contract? What was going to be appealing to me? I never left the cash accumulation stage. I have been in the same phase, which is buying an undervalued commodity, adding value called real estate, adding value to it like nobody else, marketing it unequivocally like nobody else. And then I don't hold it. I sell it. And this was before any flip show was on TV. It was before any of that, you know, no money down stuff. I was doing it and, and making about 25. We, for the first five years of my career, I didn't do a house worth more than 100 grand. But we were, we were at the point in, in the early 90s that we were making $25,000 a house. Yeah. Yeah. I remember. Yeah. You know, and then, then I got out of uh, one day I'm on the way to church. I'm, I'm with my wife and I'm saying, honey, I'm kind of tired of doing 20 houses a year, you know, 20 broken promises, 20 plumbers with their pants falling down halfway down their cracks. Right. You know, I mean, I want to do something different. Let's do what we're doing, but let's do it on the ocean. Let's just put it, I'm not a gambler, but let's put it all on black. Let's sell all this stuff, all these little houses. Let's even sell our own house. And by the way, we were living that lifestyle as the rich and famous. We sold it all. I mean, all. Wow. We, we moved to an efficiency so small that you could flip the eggs from the shower. It, <laughs> it, ser- I kid you not. So I, I, I ended up you know, convincing my wife. I said, honey, and this is a mantra that we still live by, and I suggest everybody lives by, sacrifice today for a better tomorrow. Honey, let's, yeah. let's give it up now. We'll have time for the fancy house. And we had, I mean, for our age, we were still in our late 20s. We had a great house with a guest house. She had a Mercedes. I mean, it wow. was the life. And I, and I said, you know what? Enough. Let's sell this. We had, we had some equity in our house. We we just gotten married. Let's sell it. Let's go do these houses, the high end houses on the ocean. And uh, sure enough, we did our first oceanfront spec home, being built, house being built without a buyer in mind, in 1992 for 2.2 million. And now 20, almost 25 years later, on the high end, we we've done 41 ish. I gotta look again. 41. Uh, transactions or 41 projects with an average selling price of around 14 million. Wow. Wow. And I mean, you, d- you did done some even like higher than that from what I recall. I mean, like in the, you know, 30 million range or more, 40 million is, I mean, just incredible, incredible. So, um, you know, I know I, I love the messages that you have that you give in your make it big book. And, and the first one I think is probably the most important one. And by the way, guys, for those of you that I, and I highly recommend you all get this book. It's his, the book is about 49 life lessons. And the first one is finding your highest calling. Can you speak to that one? Cause I just think that one's so important as it relates to my listeners. And we only got a short time and we got, we got 49 chapters. We wouldn't be able to do all. Yeah, I know we're not going to do them all. <laughs> I, I got that for sure. The, the basic, the premise on that is, is each one of us has a professional and a spiritual highest calling. Now we're going to, we'll say the spiritual for later, but at, at, at that young age, you, you, and, and at any age, really, if you haven't found it yet, God has gifted you with a professional highest calling. In other words, what you do to put food on your table and money in your bank account you are better at something than most people and right. and, and it takes sometimes it takes a, a half a lifetime or an entire life to, fi- to find out what that was what that is and i knew for me obviously with this troubled background and going from school to school and you know juvenile detention hall to juvenile detention hall there there was an opportunity to take out the the eraser of life that i think life gives you about a half dozen times you can turn around to the chalkboard of life and say i'm done with this phase i'm erasing it and I need to find what this, what what it is that that, that I'm better at than most, and not, at, not right. better at than everybody, but better at than most. And then that gives you a competitive advantage. And for me, you know, it it was it took the macro form of real estate, but the micro form of of buying, adding value, marketing like no one else, and then selling for top dollar. Right. Wow. Wow. Well, I know you know you can add a ton of value around the mindset associated with really being a success in anything. Can you speak to that? Yeah, I, I guess go a little deeper on that. You know, I'm okay. going to take your listeners through three, three, three quick phases. First of all, awesome. is, is if you're listening to this and you listen to, to Rod's uh, podcast, in all likelihood, you're motivated. 
when you when you hang up the phone or when you we put the podcast down. And I will tell you, and this is a post mortem now, looking back over twenty five years, this is something that came to me quite recently is how motivation doesn't last, and and it doesn't last for me, and it doesn't last for Rod, and it doesn't last for Richard Branson or Donald Trump or whoever it is that you look up to any business icon that you look up to, motivation will tonight wash off with the soap and go down the drain. And, and that, that's, just, that's the case in, in business. It's the case with your diet. It's the case with relationships. You name it, you can read a motivational quote on Facebook, and within seconds, it dissipates. It just evaporates. So don't beat yourself up if you can't stay motivated. The next thing that you'll find is that you, you will find as you watch a, a, a great movie or read a, a, a book, you'll find inspiration. So, so if motivation washes off and goes down the drain with a soap tonight, inspiration lasts like the effects of a bad sunburn. In other words, it, it, it lingers around for a while, but you'll find after you put that book down or you walk out of that movie theater, within a few days, if not a week, that inspiration will fade like the effects of a bad sunburn once you and i realized that i i latched onto aspiration aspiration is something that can alter your your dna and it can forever change your life and the lives of those you love and i want you to understand why so motivation and inspiration can ignite aspiration but once we latch onto aspiration in other words but two simple t- t- uh, tests that I would ask that you do. Who do you aspire to emulate? Think of somebody that you look up to. Think of somebody, and it can be in business, it can be in life in general, it can be in a relationship, it can be a person who's fit. Who in life do you aspire to emulate? Now, I have a number of people. I have fictional characters. They aren't even real Avatars. <laughs> yeah, well, no, I have like Willy Wonka is a is a, is oh, a fan, fantastic. If you read Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, it's the it's the most brilliant marketing book ever written. I, I right. read that from a marketing perspective, and I think I aspire to be like Willy Wonka, even though he's a fictional character. Robin Hood, fictional character, but look, we've got ten thousand people that are in housing in Haiti because I kind of was able to play a modern day Robin Hood role. And then, yeah. then some real people. Who, Frank, do you aspire to emulate? And then sample parts of their personality. You're not going to copy them because you're unique. You're you. But you're going to sample parts of what made you aspire to be like them, and you're going to absorb them into your, your being, to yourself. First, That's the first. Who do you aspire to emulate? The second part is, what legacy do you aspire to leave behind for yourself, for your kids, for your grandkids? But it... But but that has to be something a lot deeper. You can't motivate to leave a legacy bes- behind. You can't inspire to leave a legacy. You have to aspire to leave an enduring legacy. And I, as I look back on my you know twenty five plus year career uh, life, I guess professional life, I have aspired only to a handful of things. I mean, a handful of things that that took and altered my DNA. So and 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 I have been forever changed since I've done that. And, and one would be the real estate artist. You know, I, I obviously with the GPA, I didn't have any dream or any any. You know, my yearbook wasn't signed with the most likely to succeed. I aspired <laughs> to become a real estate artist and to be able to build three dimensional art on a sun drenched canvas known as Atlantic Ocean. I can't sing. I can't carry a tune on a on a guitar. I can't even draw a stick figure. But my artistry is three dimensional, and I I aspired to be the world's only real estate artist. One, two, to write books and write five books in four different genres. I aspired to do that. I had to change who I was to be able to do that. Three was my hobby, ultra marathoning, which is running races of, of over 100 miles, continuous miles, running for 24, 36, 40 hours straight. I aspired to do that. I wasn't like that. I changed my DNA to become that. And you know, finally, the, the charity. That was something I had no clue how to do that, but I aspired to touch the lives of others. And look, now we've built 23 self-sufficient villages in 13 years in Haiti. But that, yeah, but, but but when you when you latch on to aspiration, and you work every day towards that aspiration, and you use motivation and inspiration, but that only ignites something that Rod aspires to become, who he who he might want to emulate, and aspires what legacy Rod wants to leave behind. Yeah, wow, yeah, you know, I uh, I found out about uh, your ultra marathoning as well, which is, can you just speak to that that that. Uh, 
uh, race in the desert for a minute. That's just I think people would be blown away by how challenging that yeah, is. I, mean, I was one step away from the couch couch potato kind of person. I mean, I, I had a fast twitch muscle in me from my tennis twitch t- tennis twitch my tennis tennis pro days. So I was a fast runner. But as we age, you know, you slow down. And I stumbled onto the sport of ultra marathoning a little over ten years ago. And I have run. Matter of fact, I this morning I went out at four. 30 and ran 20 miles before you know I even got into work because I'm training for the 10th time wow. what the National Geographic calls the toughest foot race. This is National Geographic, it's not my claim. The toughest foot race in the world called the Badwater Ultra Marathon. Google it, look it up. Badwater Ultra Marathon, it's a 135 mile nonstop foot race through the Death Valley Desert in July on blacktop pavement. So you're not running in the desert. You're actually running on pavement that's that can crest 200 degrees, and the ambient air temperature. One year we saw 136 degrees. It's typically in the daytime around 125. But um, just imagine running, you know, from the lowest point in the Western Hemisphere, which is called Badwater, is 282 feet below sea level. Below sea level for 42 miles, and you're up to at mile 60. You're a mile above sea level. Then you're back down to sea level, and you keep doing up and down, and eventually you finish at 9,000 feet some 40 hours later in that kind of heat nonstop. If you don't finish in 48 hours, you're disqualified. So when I heard about that race, it was what I call the three I's in life, insurmountable, incomprehensible, and impossible. (laughs) Who, Who in the world? could do something i had never run a marathon let alone an ultra and i stumbled across it i became instantly intoxicated by the thought of that race i changed my dna to be able to finish i've run it nine times i finished it six i failed three but i I, you know I, i i advocate that everybody identify their life's bad water insurmountable incomprehensible and impossible and say yes to it instead of no Oh, I love that, guys. I hope you heard that. Find your insurmountable, impossible, and what was the other one? Incomprehensible. Uh, Incomprehensible, and go for it. And you know what? Some of you might think multifamily real estate is that way, and there you go. I mean, that's that's a great metaphor. Before we leave that topic, when I first heard of it, I... I thought, no way. I mean, I mean, just think about that. You know, there's, it's impossible to run 135 miles through that kind of heat. But you know what? Others had done it. So that means right. it, is, it is physically. Now, there are others that are very gifted that finish that race in 24 hours. I go to survive. I don't go to win. I just go right. to see the finish line. And you know what? I am, as I said at the very beginning of the podcast with this, this Life's Highest Calling, I'm better than most at it. I'm not the best. Obviously, it takes me 16, 20 hours longer than the winter, but I'm better than most because I aspired to finish and to enter first and finish that race. What is your life's bad water? What is your insurmountable, incomprehensible and impossible? And learn to say yes more than no. Yeah, uh, I love that. I love that. I hope you guys are taking notes. That's awesome. Yeah. So so, uh, you know, I, I flagged a couple of other points in your in your make it big and 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 some of the things that really resonated with me like acting with integrity you know i don't know if you can i mean that's i guess that's kind of self-explanatory but but uh i love that do your job do it well you know i i you know not don't just go there and do it but do it you know with passion and 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 do the best you possibly can what are your what are your favorite pieces in in that book i mean what what it, what resonated well, with I mean, you the most to, to expand it a little bit more on the do your job do it well there, there's one, one of my okay. favorite chapters is, is is take your take the lunch pail approach take okay. the lunch pail and basically that says i mean what 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 you're hearing might sound like wow his life is super exciting what he does with these big mansions and all you know what right. i inventoried my days w- one year 365 days i found that 97% of my days were spent pursuing what I refer to as extraordinarily golden moments found in nine. So 97% of 365 is basically 355 days of, of grunt, hard packing the lunch pail, showing up day in and day out. And, and maybe 10 of those days were extraordinarily golden moments. So I have no issue with, with, you know, if, if everyday life was, was, was truly a soap opera, everybody's life would be exciting. But you, you watch a soap opera or something like The Bachelorette or whatever on TV, life isn't like that. Like, like, not right. 97% of life is, is just tough and drudgery and heartbreak and struggle. But what, when you pack that lunch pail, you got two choices. You know, you, you're going to pack it. Are you going to show up with a bad attitude? Are you going to show up and you're going to quit? Are you going to show up and, and feel sorry for yourself? 
I mean, when those, it's okay to feel those sensations coming over you, but you've got to shut them down. And, and eventually, I mean, a good, a good metaphor for, for the lunch pail approach is, is Mount Rushmore. Gutzon Borglum is the sculptor to Mount, to Mount Rushmore. Gutzon Borglum, although he died before Mount Rushmore was finished, and his son ended up finishing Mount Rushmore, for 14 years straight, he packed his lunch pail. And you can imagine on day one, week one, month one, you couldn't make out the nose hair on George Washington. Right? <laughs> there's, no, there's no progress. But eventually, by, I mean, look at, when you next time pull up an image of Mount Rushmore and think about what that man had to do with his, pe- his, his, his masons, to create one of the seven wonders of the world. It didn't happen overnight. His overnight success took 20 years. That's what I'm wow. talking about in the, taking the lunch pail approach every day. That's a great analogy. Wow. Awesome. Uh, you know, and I, I want to also mention, you know, obviously, you know, your charity um, and and really I'm, I'm holding your book, The Tap, in my hand as well, which really resonated with me. By the way, guys, I mean, just to give you an example of the caliber of these books, the, the – um, uh, forwards on both Make It Big and, and uh, The Tap were written by a billionaire, Rich DeVos, that built and owned Amway. So, I mean, just that gives you an idea of the caliber of the uh, and the content. But can you speak to The Tap? I mean, can you give us just a little thing? Because I, I really want my listeners to hear that, yeah. too, because I've talked about giving back on several several. Let occasions. me go one more chapter and Make It Big, and then we'll run Oh, the thank tab. you. Yeah, I, please, I just, please, there's, please. There's one in there that, that I kind of like the updated version because remember, Make It Big came out some 14 years ago, and there's a lot of change right. that's happened. The let me just open it up here. So, so chapter 25 talks about and the, the the verbatim title is gently yet often exercise your risk threshold like a muscle. Oh yeah. Eventually, you become stronger and able to withstand greater pressure. So, if you were to ask me my favorite two chapters, it would be that chapter and chapter 32, which we'll talk about, which kind of was the impetus for the entire book, The Tap. But okay. 25. Chapter 25, Exercise Your Wrist Threshold Like a Muscle. I know there are people out there that are w- better funded than I am, that are certainly smarter than I am, have better connections than I do, were brought up in, the, in an industry, had a father that was in real estate, had a lot more going for them than I did. The primary thing that I harnessed pretty early was the ability to overcome the fear associated with taking a risk. And I want to talk about that because this is going to be your listeners single greatest impediment to their success it's not money or the lack of money it's not lack of connections it's not even lack of education it's going to be your the the the, the following sequence so when we think about taking a risk the thought of taking a risk and in this case investing in real estate the next sensation that rushes to the brain is another four-letter word called fear yep so so this is this is natural. I, I will let me preface the, the the rest of my statement by saying I'm afraid every day of my life. I have not I have not overcome the fear. I think it's actually not a, a wise thing to do. Is I I realize that that when I think about taking a risk, and the risk could be business, it could be running across a desert, it could be in a relationship, whatever. That risk is going to produce this sensation called fear. When you, when you think about fear, that fear is associated with the risk, which is associated with a big change or a big challenge in your life. Almost every time you take, you think about taking a risk, it's associated with a big change or a big challenge. Now, fear as a sensation inherently because of our ancestry and going back to the caveman days, it's meant to stop us. It's meant to stop us from self harm, right? It's, it's the, it's sure, sure. It's primal. It's the, exactly, that's the word I'm looking for. It's primal. Yeah. But but if 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 you take the instinct and you take the, the I call it a sensation, if fear is always associated with the thought of taking a risk, and risk is almost always associated with a big change or challenge, I now welcome the sensation of fear. Doesn't mean I follow through with every deal, Rod, or everything that that right. creates fear. Sometimes some of my better deals I've made are the ones I walked away from. But I'm not going to walk away from it sheerly and solely because of fear. No, no, I will not do that. I'll do my research. I'll do my homework. And if something comes up, this is I shouldn't do it. I won't do it. But if once you grasp the understanding of, you know, kind of in a, in a, in a graph, it would be risk equals fear and fear is associated with big change or challenge. Then you'll learn to gently, as chapter 25 says, gently yet often 
gently yet often, like going to the gym, exercise your wrist threshold, your wrist tolerance, your wrist muscle. Your wrist muscle, yeah. Eventually, it becomes stronger and is able to withstand greater pressure. So to me, the biggest risk I ever took was that first $50,000 crack house because I was so safe in my tennis $100,000 a year tennis job. Now, if we're doing a you know a five ten twenty million dollar house there there is there's there's fear, but I've learned that you know I mean the fear might be about I'm pushing the envelope on a price per square foot or something I'm doing crazy with it with a design but i'm no I'm no longer afraid of taking the risk associated with that with with putting my money where my mouth is no i I agree and I, I'll tell you uh, one of my mentors, Tony Robbins, has a saying that the quality of your life is in direct proportion to the amount of discomfort you can comfortably stand, and this ties into that every if you if you guys think back about every extraordinary thing in your life that's ever happened, typically you've gotten outside of your comfort zone, so that's just to add some emphasis to your thresh uh your fear muscle analogy. But, you know, the, the, the other thing is, is we have, um, you know, I have where I'm a little wired a little differently is I have kind of an addictive personality. I have as, 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 a, as a therapist that I see says, she says, Frank, you've been so fortunate that you found a and I use this now when I'm speaking to to group, you know, adults and even kids and, you know, <laughs> commencement speeches and stuff that, that we all have some self-destructive tendencies inside of us. And, and you can inventory yours on a piece of paper. We all have them. I have found that if, if I have an addictive personality, my, I'm addicted to excitement. I mean, it's, I, I'm not addicted to drugs. Mm. I could be addicted to drugs or drinking or something else, but I, I'm addicted to excitement. And business provides, and especially spec building, provides excitement. I have found instead of a destructive outlet for my addictive personality, I found a constructive outlet for that mm. for that tendency. So for those of you who who struggle with certain you know personality glitches, if you will, find a constructive outlet for something that might have been self-destructive before. And so for me, it's been wonderful that I've, I've been able to find and hold on to for all these years that uh, ability to, to, to take risk in the face of fear. Yes, let's find something sustainable. You know, the, construct- the destructive ones aren't sustainable. Find one that's sustainable. That's, that's really good. That's really good. So you talked about a chapter that was the basis for the tap. Yes, yeah, so if we move from chapter 25 and make it big to chapter 32, which is a really long title to a chapter, many of us are fortunate uh, to be blessed with the ability to succeed, not for our sole benefit, but so we may apply the result of our success to assist others. The whole premise behind the tap is, if you, and if you pull it up online, <clears throat> go, go to Amazon and look at the image of the book. There isn't even a subtitle to it. It's two words, the tap. And if you, if you know the image of Michelangelo's painting in the Sistine Chapel where you have the finger of God touching the finger of Adam, well, I got permission from the, from the Vatican to remove the, uh, the, the image of, of Adam and put you, the reader, the finger of God coming down and tapping you on the shoulder. And the tap, if you're not, don't let the fact it's, it, it is a, a spiritual book or a religious book read by Hindus, Muslims, Jews, and Christians, by the way, so it doesn't matter what religion that you, you have if you have none at all. It, 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 is a, it is a business book. It is a, a book to how to succeed in the business we're all in, the business of life. And, and once you recognize that God does come down and tap you on the shoulder, calling you to more than you're doing right now, the book simply teaches you how to, A, recognize what I refer to as life's great tap moments and B, how to act on them as a responsible steward for the blessings God's giving you. Remember, we go back to that very first question Rod asked, what is your professional highest calling? Something you do better than most. That's a gift. And and the tap teaches you how to recognize both professionally and spiritually what that gift is and two, to act on it. And if I hadn't acted on my one of my most epiphanous tap moments, Back 15 years ago, there wouldn't be 23 self-sufficient villages in Haiti housing 10,400 people. So I, I tell you, if you, if you want just a general, Make It Big is a fantastic kind of a philosophical book on, yes, how to make it big. The tap is a little more truncated, is a little more laser focused on, you know, how to share your blessings with others. What's the point of filling your garage with more cars, your closet with more clothes, and your pantry with more food? There's a limit. There will be a limit if you're successful in applying Rod's principles into buying and holding and, and cash flowing real estate. But at some point, you, and it, it isn't at some point for the money part. I mean, for, for, for the three T's, time, talent, and treasure. You can share, share your time. You can share your talent. 
might take you a little while to share your treasure, but get in the habit of sharing your blessings with those less fortunate. And that they don't have to be financial blessings, guys. And, and I've talked about this. I, I can't tell you, you know, how 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 valuable it is just to give of your time. Like 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 Frank said, tell, can you can you speak to that epiphany that you had? I'm just curious what that was. If, if, you know, if it's yeah, you know, I go, lightning lightning coming yeah, out of the sky. Yeah, it was definitely what, a lightning coming out of the sky moment. And, and I talk about it in great detail because in in the tab, and everybody can relate to something similar where I'm. You know, I'm I'm laser focused on all the things I just referenced: more cars, more clothes, more food, more everything, private planes, and I'm I'm really ascending the ladder of success. And we had just sold the most expensive spec home in the history of Palm Beach County, which back in the late late 90s was somewhere around 14 million dollars. I mean, there was more expensive homes sold, but never on spec. So we were featured in on the cover of the Miami Herald or some magazine or newspaper, and and I'm so intent. On, you know, I go to the newsstand, I put a quarter in I, at five in the morning, I pull 10 newspapers out, you know, I don't pay for them, I run home and I'm ready to, you know, read. Look, look how do I look first, right? I mean, did right. I get the hair right? Did I get the shit right? <laughs> and, what, and, did, and what about the pictures of the house and the quotes? And yet, as, as this, is, this is back when we read newspapers like old fashioned, where you crisply snap them open and you read one column and then you. As I snap that paper o- open, on the right side of the column is my photo. On the left-hand side of the page was an image of a man being fed out the back of a beat-up old Econoline van from a soup kitchen who would come out from underneath an overpass on I-95. Now, there but for the grace of God go I. If I don't put a blow dryer and a curling iron to my hair and I don't shave and I don't put on a decent shirt, I can look I, – I, it looked identical to me, this guy, only a little bit unkempt. I'm thinking, oh my God, you know, 10, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, I was in a, I was in a, a juvenile detention hall. I took a right turn, meaning I made a right decisions. He might have taken a left turn, made some wrong decisions. There, but for the grace of God, go I. Why was I on the right hand side of the page? Mind you, I mean, I spent a lot of time in juvenile detention. Why was I on the right hand side of the page, not on his side of the page? And I, I, I felt wow. instant guilt. I felt horrible. I felt like, well, what are you doing with your life? And honestly, at that point, Rod, even though I was succeeding, I was pretty depressed. I was pretty down. It wasn't, you know, the, the things of the world were not satisfying me anymore, and they never would have. So I went and I started volunteering at the soup kitchen. The, the, by the way, the name of the soup kitchen was the Caring Kitchen. And when I wow. got to the point where I could do more than just volunteer there, we started the Caring House Project. I borrowed the name from them, and hence we have built... 23 yeah. self-sufficient villages. But if I wasn't for me reading that article and saying, you know what, simply go volunteer at that soup kitchen for one hour a week. And it, it put me acutely in touch with my spiritual highest calling. Oh, that's that's a beautiful story. I got to tell you, that was beautiful. I, I can tell you, and I, I want to share mine because I haven't shared it uh, on my podcast here, but my epiphany <coughs> was about 16 years ago, my brother and I decided to feed five families and we for the holidays and we, we went up to one house and uh, this lady answered the door and I had this big basket of food and she started crying when she saw the food and then her five children came out and saw the food and they all started crying. And since then, I've fed 40,000 children for the holidays. Uh, and I can tell you, I was depressed before I started doing that as well. And and so, guys, that if those of you that are listening, you know, you don't have to you don't have to think in these big numbers. But anything you do will help you uh, emotionally, and 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 it always comes back. I got to tell you, it, wouldn't you agree, Frank? What you give comes back uh, in spades. Well, I mean, that's biblical, right? I mean, right. that is biblical. Right. And 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 you know what? Here's the simple: forget the Bible for a minute, because everybody's afraid of the dogma. If if you sit down or you kneel down or if you scream at prayers at night or in the morning or when things are bad, you typically, if you inventory your prayers, you're praying for some form of more, more health, wealth, peace, love, happiness, joy for yourself or somebody you love. I mean, inventory your prayers tonight if you pray. Mm. It contains – and that's okay. Mm-hmm. It's okay. I mean, that's what, that's what God wants us to pray for. But when you're praying for that form of more, what kind of, res- what kind of steward, what kind of – responsible steward, are you for the more that you already have? And and my believe me, come to Haiti with me sometime. You'll see you you are you're one of the richest people in the world, right? So right. if you're a responsible steward for the more that you already have, isn't it just make sense that God's going to reward you with the more that you're praying for? Look at Bill Gates. I mean you want a business story, here's a guy who's the richest man in the world. 
who, who has changed the world, obviously with his operating system, but what he's done through the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, as was referenced by Bono when he and extraordinary he, he will he will change the world twice. And the second time right. will be more important than the first, based upon him being a responsible steward for the blessings God's given him in terms of financial yeah. financial. Couldn't agree more. And and you know, and, and not only is, is is that foundation doing it, but but he's he's uh, elicited you know, uh, billions from his from his uh, peers uh, and uh, with his uh, giving challenge and just incredible. So, well, I, I'm really glad we got to, to talk about this uh, with you, Frank, because it's it's just so important. And the people listening are usually listening to how to buy multifamily apartments and, and how to manage them and how to, you know, how to. Uh, finance them and everything else. But I got to tell you, this session has been much more important and I hope you guys get it. Uh, the value of, of mindset, the value of, of giving back, uh, the value of, of, of you know, uh, conditioning your stress muscle. Um, Frank, uh, what have I not asked you that you would like to like to add? Uh, we're getting you know closer to the end here, but uh, you've got so much wisdom. Is there something else that you think can add value? You know, I, I mean, it, it's it's too bad that um, well, it's not too bad. I have so much that I wanted to sh- say about our craft, which is real estate, and mm-hmm. and you know, when you, what Rob just said about about how how to make money in in, in cash flowing real estate, my bur- my book burst this, w- which is the, my most recent real estate book. It contains everything I know in real estate for the uh, over the past twenty five years, and I'll tell you that that that. Maybe we come back on a future podcast, you know, to, to talk I'd lo- about I'd love just, that, Frank. just re- you know, just real estate. Because I'll tell you that that you, you, real estate is the greatest builder of of net worth in the history of the United States. And, and in my book, first this, I went back and I studied six different real estate cycles dating to the dating back to the mid '70s. Because a lot of people are afraid that you know we come in these cycles and the market's going to crash again. And boy, I, my uncle told me not to get involved in real estate. Do you know that since the last Great Depression, before the one that took place in, if you want to call it a Great Depression, that took place in 2010, let's say, and since 1929, which is the last, you know, the one Great Depression we all refer to, real estate had appreciated across the country. Now, again, every market's local, right? We don't have a, a, a global market. But, but if you look at the values of real estate since the last Great Depression, 1929, they appreciate every year until 2009. What commodity, what stock, what bond can you say that appreciated every single year? And then it had a blip. It had a hiccup from maybe it was a good one from 2009, 10, 11, where real estate on a national level went down, you know, because Florida contributed to 40 percent of that decrease. Oh, yeah. I, I think I personally did. <laughs> you did. But but if you were to invest in something that had a 70 plus track rec- your track record of appreciation, mind you, there were years that the appreciation didn't keep up with inflation. OK, I mean, you can be a you know a protagonist and you can argue this. But for the most part, you are in the right place, in the right space as far as buying and holding, because, yes, I, I add value and I'm able to to to. Uh, make a rate of return that's significantly greater than anything else I could make by, by buying and, and selling. But people who are still, as you get back to that fear thing, when it comes to real estate, wh- what are they going to do? They, they're afraid to buy. There's, there's millions of people that are afraid to buy, but they got to live somewhere. 